capstone and thesis presentations. And our first speaker today is Alexis Zinberg. She did a thesis and not a capstone paper. And the title of her project is Street Art as Medium for Political Discourse in the Post-Soviet Regime. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's early on a Friday morning. Uh, my, my advisor, Dr. Hilton, is here from Art History and Museum Studies, and I really appreciate that. My family came, I have some friends here, so that's a treat for me. Uh, for the next 30 minutes, or 20 minutes, and then 10 minutes of questions and answers, I'm going to be talking about the research that I've been doing for the last year. It focuses on, the title is called The Spray Can is Mightier Than the Sword, Street Art as a Medium for Political Discourse in the Post-Soviet Region. Um, my project investigates the way that art and artists use graffiti or street art in an effective alternative medium for political discourse, political expression. Um, of course, there are issues of hooliganism and private property, but those issues aside, graffiti is an anonymous and free way for the public to share banned information, uh, promote ignored causes, and discuss society's ills in the public sphere. I argue that graffiti, as an art of discourse, shares the true narrative of a city, uninhibited by official censors. So the region's vast, and I chose a few states to offer a more thorough analysis to those states. I chose Russia, Belarus, and Hungary, um, because either they're authoritarian or authoritarian-leading states where opposition groups and dissenting individuals uh, lack an unrestricted access to the media, in my opinion, via traditional channels like the Nightly News and the Daily Digest. There is the aspect of the internet, but that's separate, um, in my opinion, from the traditional channels. And I can go more into that if, if anyone has any questions in the question and answer period. Uh, as a result of these restrictions, those wishing to express their political sentiment are forced to seek out alternative avenues of expression. Of course, there are street protests and there are uh, there is the blogosphere again, but in street protests, for example, in Minsk on July 3rd, 2011, they, they tried to protest in the street, but it ended in, in quite violent oppression. Um, Several hundred went to, to jail for that. Or in the blogosphere, IP addresses can be traced and hackers can get into your information, so I don't necessarily trust it as a truly free avenue of discourse. Um, graffiti, on the other hand, is untraceable. People operate through pseudonym-protected identities, and it, it really allows people access to the public, gives people access to a public spa uh, stage. Uh, where they can speak as critically and frankly as they wish. So I'm just going to tell you briefly about my research, and then I will go into my images, which is the exciting part of this presentation. Uh, on a Georgetown School Foreign Service Dean's Office grant, I traveled throughout the region uh, photographing graffiti, talking to, interviewing artists, um, and I did that throughout the summer of 2011. And then I returned to Moscow as a Cosmo scholar in March 2012 to monitor the changes between Moscow in June and August versus Moscow in March, because March was when the, elect, the president election took place. And there were some significant changes. Uh, I organized this discussion to give it a social scientific consistency. Um, because graffiti is such a dynamic art, it's always changing every day, it's always buffed, someone new is putting something up. And so in order to quantify it, or attempt to quantify it, um, I went to six locations throughout each city. I went to a student district, I went to an artist district, I went to downtown district, I went to uh, a graffiti spot, which is where graffiti artists know that they can go to do graffiti kind of in a permitted way, if not legal. Um, I went to the end of the line, which is I literally took the bus or the metro to the end of the line and saw what was there. And then the last uh, is, uh, I also went to, oh, to uh, a market area, right? So around a market, but actually it turned out that there was nothing around the market. Uh, so, I've chosen a few slides from my fieldwork, which I think best illustrate some of the concepts that I encountered as my project unfolded. Uh, the first slide, this is from Minsk, and one of the ideas I want to show here is that uh, downtown Minsk is a very, Alexander Lukashenko runs the last dictatorship in Europe, it's said. So he run, he, the downtown sphere is a very controlled, very monitored area, both by the KGB and by other other Belarusians who kind of watch each other. And so the top two images are in the downtown sphere. Here on the left you have Lukashenko sucks, and on the right you have freedom to the anarchist Nikolai Denka. And the one on the left is is a sten is freehand, and the one on the right is a stencil. And both of those methods are very quick. You can make a stencil at home, and you put it up, and you just cover it. So it's very, very fast. And obviously on the left, there's someone waiting for a bus or something, and he just wrote it very quickly, or she. Um, so 
artists who actually want to express themselves of course can do it in the public sphere, but it's very quickly buffed, it's removed, so they're forced to go to these dark places outside of the city center to really express themselves. So these bottom two images are in the this ideal space. It's a seven-story parking garage outside of the city, and it um, and here on the left you have the 15th of March is the day against uh, police brutality, and you have the protester and the police officer kind of hitting each other, and on the right you have very small says, we will have, and then freedom. So you have these more murals, you have people putting more effort into into the art, and it's, it's more aesthetically pleasing, and uh, perhaps more critical, this freedom mural actually existed next to someone had written the names Barack Obama and Mikhail Gorbachev, perhaps to encourage them to hear the hear their wishes for freedom. Um, so this just basically shows the dichotomy between downtown and end-of-the-line art in Minsk where the downtown area is very tightly monitored. And here's just a graph that I went through all of my images, I had thousands of images, and I put seven categories for each one based on um, what the theme was. And uh, so political is the most uh, explicit, and then you have social and, and sports and, and music, etc. So of the political images, I, I put with these six locations, which location is the most political? And on the right left, that blue section is the student area, and that's outside downtown Minsk. The, the yellow is the graffiti spot, and the purple is the end of the line. So you can see that the majority is outside of the downtown area versus in other cities where um, the graph looks quite different. My next image is, if you consider Jean Baudrillard's simulac simulacrum and simulation, um, where he talks about the fabricate, the, si the, the original image and then the, the image of the, the form, I'm sorry, the original form and then the image, so where the image becomes more real than the form and the cult of personality about Putin becomes more real than Putin himself. And, um, you know, you see his image in, in, in banners and you see it in graffiti and it, it almost feels like when you actually see him, this is when I was at the, the protest on election day, or I'm very familiar that the protest, the demonstration pro-Putin celebration, um, he almost doesn't feel real because of the, because of the propagated images of, of him. And so there's this Baudrillard idea that the fabricated signs and symbols, which are constructions or smeary, smear simulations of reality become more real than reality. And actually, this image at the bottom on the right is directly beneath where he's speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's in the metro, right under the Kremlin. This is the day before the elections, and this is election day. So, um, so you can just kind of consider those. And this is an anti-Putin stencil uh, sticker. And then this one is just also downtown and another uh, anti-Putin election-related sticker. But um, so yeah, it just it just shows how he's he's propagated on the streets more it, so much that when his real existence becomes less um, perhaps dominated over by the cult of information. So the next uh, the next slide. This is a slide. This up on the left is from Budapest. And on the right is from uh, from Moscow during the election. And on the Budapest, it, it kind of follows this Canadian theorist. Hi, you guys can come in if you want. It, it follows this Canadian theorist, Marshall McLuhan, who says that the medium is the message. So the argument here is that the tools and the actual act of graffiti to produce the graffiti um, is just as important as the message expressed. So here on the left, it says uh, the freedom of speech. And it has the guy with his eyes covered. And on the right, it says, I love free press. I love independent courts. And the idea of having to use the street to express these ideas, um, to me, shows exactly how free the nature, the art form is. And it shows that people are almost using it in a, in a desperation, an anxious act to express these, these other frustrations in a satirical way that maybe they can't express otherwise. Um, so this is another issue, another interesting thing that I saw. So the guy on the top left is a nationalist writer. It's crossed out in orange, and someone wrote a hammer and sickle, in, which is a, a symbol of communism. And then someone wrote both of them out in green. And this one is in Budapest. All three of these are in Budapest. 
And then in the next one, someone wrote fa smash fascism, crossed it out, wrote Zionism. It's, it's showing the, the discourse that exists in the downtown sphere. And in the downtown sphere where it's heavily trafficked, there's so many people, it's high population, they know that their stuff is going to get seen. People contradict each other on the streets, which I thought was really interesting, versus this bottom one, which is the same artist, the same nationalist um, graffiti artist with the Jewish star on the noose, and this is outside of the downtown center, and you can see just the difference between how someone's not, no one, no one contradicts their statement. Um, so downtown Budapest, as opposed to Minsk, is very politicized versus the outside, which essentially goes un un uncontested. Um, and here's another example of that. This is a graffiti on the left that I saw in Moscow on a Sunday, the Sunday the 2nd of March 2011, 2012, and election day was the 4th. So here's Putin, and it's a pro-Putin stencil, and it says, Ev revolution with a cross out R, evolution. By Monday, the next day, it was buffed out. You can kind of see it, but not really. And by Tuesday, someone wrote, sorry. <laughs> so it's very interesting. And, and so, any, or, yeah, the 2nd, the 3rd, and the 4th. So. It, to me, not only is this a great example of the discourse that exists on the streets, because graffiti does show a discourse, it is a narrative that can be read, which is what I'm trying to express. Um, it shows the discourse, but it also, to me, is a very interesting ex example of a bigger issue that I saw in this project. Um, a most surprising thing that I ran into is, despite the fact that all of these images are so explicitly political, in my own opinion, they the artists continue to tell me in interviews that their work is not political. And that is a very interesting thing to me because when on the streets graffiti depicts a political leader in a compromising state or a construction contract is corrupt, um, and the artists continue to say that the art is political, I think that that's incorrect. And when so why would they do this? Perhaps they want plausible deniability. They, If they eventually get caught, they don't want to have to take responsibility for their art if it is political. Perhaps they see themselves in relation to more political, you know, groups that have shown up during, especially during the, the election recently, um, that are making themselves very seen in the public space and getting arrested and making a scene as activists. And so perhaps they feel like that cheapens their art to call them activists, so they put themselves as apolitical artists. Um, you know, there are a, a bunch of reasons why it would happen, but the bottom line is when you put your art in the public space, like graffiti, regardless of what your intention is, it's going to be interpreted by your viewer in a within a politicized context. And so when you're putting this kind of situation in the streets during an election week, not just an election period, a week of elections, it, it certainly has a message. It, it expresses a political message. Um, even, you know, even with, even if someone was here telling you it wasn't political, the artist himself, I have a hard time believing that any art is apolitical, especially in a politicized environment. Um, and then my last slide, second to last slide, I apologize. <laughs> this is, on the left you have one of the most politicized groups in St. Petersburg. This is the Group of Change. And on top it says Modernization or Death, and then it says Group of Change. And then on the bottom, the 11th of March, and write it down, we're going to be together. The group of change often, if you can see in the pink image on the bottom, they put their livejournal.com page, which is a very popular journaling, online journaling website in Russia, where um, they, this group of change includes information about where you can go to go to the next meeting, the time, the date, etc. So they, they have this really great um, use of Re mutually reinforced message. So on the web they have a presence and on the street they have a presence which in my opinion gives them a little more legitimacy because of the saturation on the web with skeletal you know, information that maybe isn't as, uh, as taken as seriously. So they, this is a very common technique that groups do these artist groups who claim not to be political but still participate in the rallies, they, they, they do have a web presence where they are critical about these situations and also a street presence. And um, I think that the modernization or death image is actually very interesting because this is from 
August 2011, and an artist explained to me that the image is about how the opposition didn't want to create a viable opposition candidate for the election, but rather that they wanted to increase their rights, increase their education policies, increase their, I don't know, their just their personal individual rights rather than, like I said, create a viable opposition. And so when the protests started in December, you had everyone saying, oh, perhaps they want this, perhaps they want this. But in my opinion, it was very clear what they wanted from the, what was written on the streets. Uh, so, and then on the on the right, I've included a few non-group of change stencils. These two are from from Moscow. Just they use the stickers to show speed and 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 kind of to create a uniform presence throughout the city. The top and the bottom are both advertisements for certain protest events. Um, the bottom one was when they circled the Kremlin and held hands, and then the top one um, it says for for honest elections. And they both have the details of where you can go and the time you can go there and from my own experience, I saw that when you were there, you could, all, of course, you could follow t Navalny and other uh, activists on Twitter to find out where to go, where to participate. But you also, on the other hand, could go outside the metro, and in every metro stop, there would be a wall where um, the, the stickers would change by the hour or by the day, and you would see kind of where you could go that day or the next day. Um, and and, and it, was, it was actually used as a mobilizing uh, technique. So that was really interesting. Um, like I said, I organized each of my images into seven categories. And this is just a simple graph that shows the thematic distribution of Moscow graffiti between the election and non-election period. Um, in the summer of 2011, as you can see all the way on the left, the most graffiti was this guerrilla advertisement technique that they were doing, which was terrible and ugly. And it, they would essentially corporations would or businesses would invite graffiti artists or pay them to tattoo the streets with their with their slogan outside of the metro or outside of Moscow's underpasses. And then you get to the election period, and there's no advertisements, but the political graffiti goes up significantly, and also very slightly the political fascist related graffiti. I separated political fascism and political because I felt like there was so much Antifa and swastikas and, and, and stuff related to that kind of theme that it would ruin my it, it would ruin my research too much to include that as political. So um, it's just it was fascinating to see how different it was during the election. Um, why is this important? It's important for three reasons to me. I seek to fill an academic void. Uh, there's a professor at Northwestern, John Bushnell, and he wrote this amazing book called Moscow Graffiti, but it was published in 1990 and therefore perhaps too soon to uh, tell the rest of the story. So I kind of take where he leaves off. He leaves off in like 85-ish, and I take that and I go until now, and I base it all on interviews um, throughout Russia that I've done on the streets, and it's super exciting for me to participate in the academic discourse that's existing. So that was very neat. Um, and then the second, like I said, I think that it's important for, uh, for Western journalists and researchers to really consider what's written on the streets when they make assumptions about the political discourse uh, of a place, especially a place in an authoritarian state where they don't have perhaps free access to the media. And I think that also it's important that we, as as anybody in the world, understands that you can use street art to express yourself and realize the value of it as a way of expressing yourself, expressing your political sentiment, your social sentiment, whatever it may be. Um, because I think when people are have that sentiment and they see it on the street, it, it certainly reinforces your own beliefs that perhaps you were afraid to speak about otherwise, and um, it can really be a uniting force. Um, so that's uh, that's that's the short summary of this massive amount of information. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to ask. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would like to push you on the kind of so what question. Okay. Because had you been in my capstone seminar, the students will all attest, I push them on this. Why, what can you tell, I mean, do you make an explicit um, conclusion about comparison between Hungary, Russia, and Belarus? And I'd like to hear about that, because Hungary, 
I mean, it's a problematic political system, but Hungary is in the European Union, and it is at least formally a democratic country, and has, and it has, you know, competitive elections, even if it has a somewhat authoritarian leader. Um, so I was curious to why you include that. Uh, do you compare them explicitly? And then, I think, you know, you're, you're hinting that this is a form of political discourse, but as we know, the internet, Twitter, and everything was very much used to mobilize people. Do you do anything sort of trying to compare the relative impact of street graffiti with the impact of the internet uh, and Twitter, at least in those countries where it's freer in mobilizing people? Uh, so your first question is the explicit co comparison of why you chose Hungary and what you what you conclude from looking at these three cases. Sure. What's similar and what's different? Um, well, to answer that, I, yeah. I chose Hungary because, as you said, it, it perhaps is not authoritarian, it is, in my opinion, an authoritarian leaning democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and it recently had a series of issues. I think that in the last two years since uh, Fidesz came to power in 2010, I think that they've very quickly moved in that direction. And I saw that as a result, and actually mm -hmm. it's a very supported movement, mm -hmm. which is very interesting to me. So as a result, the country has become very politicized. And I think that that is, because the public space is available, that's something that is expressed in the public space that I notice. It, to me, it's when you're walking down the street in Budapest, it's very obvious that it is a politicized environment and very bipartisan, I guess if you can call it bipartisan, though it is tripartisan. Um, so that's why I chose Hungary. I thought that it, it was an outrageously politicized country having a period in a period of very heavy conflict, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and I think that the political conflict in Hungary goes back to societal conflict. Mm -hmm. I think that it's deeper. It seems like it's separated on s larger lines in political ideology, um, which perhaps makes sense. Um, my greater answers, in, in Russia, for example, for me it was fascinating because where someone might not be able to be interviewed on the television as an oppositional leader, opposition leader, um, and express themselves freely, I found that downtown in mm -hmm. St. Petersburg and in Moscow, it was very free. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's interesting where there is a totally free avenue. Um, but it's in anonymous. The it it's is anonymous, anonymous right. but okay. completely free. So it it's is a different anonymous. kind of impact. It's a different right. kind of impact. Yeah. And perhaps mm -hmm. that is a factor. Like if you're not, if you're not getting, if you're not taking credit for your statement, perhaps mm -hmm. it's not as legitimate. But um, and how it connects to to the internet sphere is really interesting. It connects very tightly, I think, as I showed with the group of change. I think that a lot of the groups doing things on the internet are very tightly associated with the groups doing the graffiti. For example, Anton Matalko in Belarus is a known journalist slash blogger, I guess blog journalist, who, you know, goes to jail and gets arrested for his for his statements on his blog, but he is connected with these with these street artists who then take his statements that he makes on his blog and they replicate them in the streets, for example. Or, or the Navalny, he mm -hmm. writes things on his blog and he'll see in the streets, stop feeding the caucuses. Or, um, I think it's a really mutually reinforcing relationship that they have with the internet. I, I mean. Okay, Professor Hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and just to follow on that, yeah. um, at, the, at the very end of where you put what you wish you could do in the future. Yes. I think that would definitely be a part. You started out today uh, talking about some of the things that were analogous and, in fact, that you might have actually chosen to do research on, such as blogs and street protests and so forth. Yeah. But you found that there was something very distinctive about these physical entities. Yeah. And if um, I mean, a lot more has been done already about blocks, I think. And you're actually adding something to that. And you could, as you also include some of those other cities where you did investigate the situation mm -hmm. and extend it, um, then it'd be really appropriate, I think, to add that and some of the other means of discourse. 
I wanted to say something else that's not directly related to your presentation, but had um, Bushnell gone beyond just Moscow graffiti in 1980, I mean 1990, he probably would have found such a different, say he'd gone to Budapest and so mm -hmm. forth, he would have found such a different situation. I mean, all of you have just spent a lot of time looking back 20 years, but we didn't have a blogosphere, we didn't have right. a lot of other things, and also we had more optimism perhaps and less frustration. But it would have been very, very different. And I wonder if you would also consider looking back at whatever rudimentary literature there was in 1989 and so forth about the kind of, um, I mean, old photographs. Mm -hmm. And I have one other question, but I'll come back to that after people have had a chance. I actually did see some old photographs, and they are all very much associated in my paper. The chapter one is about the history of the movement, and to give you the short summary, the history is about, you know, it starts with the fa the sport fanatics, and it moves through the, the fascist and anti-fascist movements, and it has the hippies and the pacifists, and the graffiti, very, and the rockers, I'm sorry, too, and the graffiti very much reflects that, the photos that I've seen from 88, 89. And people pass things out on the street. Too. Right. And, uh, yeah. It's really interesting. Well, my question related to her comment, I was curious as to uh, the difference between the amount of graffiti in the downtown area of Budapest as compared to Minsk. Is that reflecting, reflective of uh, the repression in Minsk, Minsk compared to so-called democracy in Budapest? Absolutely. And is there more surveillance on the street with cameras and things like that in a town like Minsk compared to Budapest, or do they have the same amount of surveillance or chance of getting caught or physical re you know, repre uh, um, repression by the police? Um, I was just curious about the two differences. Based on my understanding, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Not only is it CCTV cameras and police, it's also fellow citizens who are more concerned about their public sphere, the image, perhaps the image in their public, the cleanliness, the appropriateness of their public sphere in Minsk. Whereas in Budapest, it's a very, for some reason, they don't seem to care as much. I mean, it, it's also in Budapest, it's both sides participating. It's the right and the left, and <coughs> the far right, participating in the discourse. So Does that reflect in the editorials and the papers of the, of the two, uh, the two towns? Uh, you probably don't read the paper because of your age. <laughs> <laughs> you can read it on the internet. <laughs> um, sure, of course. I mean, that's one of my points: is that in a place like, Buda and like Belarus, the papers are not is free. Uh, they're they're state owned for the most part. There are independent journals and magazines, but they're. Um, they're, they're, they encounter pressure from the state, which perhaps leads to shutdowns or funding problems or whatever. Um, versus Budapest, yeah, you have all sides are participating in the in what exists of their uh, media discourse. So. I was just going to add. Um, first of all, yes, it's all over the world. But I was just going to say, I, I think that the politicization of Hungary definitely started in 2006, and it was the other side. So it was a public outrage with the 2006 protest and the police action that went on, I think. And not to forget to my front of class, but as, <laughs> as you said, you know, it is interesting that you have the dueling far right, and then to a lesser extent, the far left. It's, anyway, um, I just think it's really interesting, and, and I would want to know um, if there were still remnants of frustration left over from 2006 in graffiti in Budapest, because if, if not, has that been covered over? Is there still stuff about Yushine, the prime minister who lied publicly, or is it more fo focused on Orban now? And then, of course, the ever-present crazy skinheads. Mm -hmm. you know, is it just the, has it really evolved with the turnover? Is it really 
like such a sharp contrast that now it's all about what's happened since 2010? Um, in my opinion, yes. I haven't seen anything about about him, about the socialist leader. Um, yeah, he disappeared from the public discourse, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, two hopefully quick questions. One has to do with wordiness. I remember back to the perestroika period and the sorts of things that people would mostly pay stuff mm -hmm. and not if they even had the art supplies to paint things. <laughs> I just don't remember graffiti. But they seem to always be super wordy. That is, that, that people would, you know, fill the whole piece of paper with text. Right. There was very little art. And so I'm wondering if this wordiness has dropped. And then my other question was, I'm curious about whether the graffiti that you're seeing now in Russia is mostly anti against something, which to me might explain why people said, let's say that they, what they were doing was not political because they weren't proposing something. Right. They were just being against something. Um, thank you for those questions. That the, the, those are interesting questions. I think wordiness, absolutely. It is specifically stated by a number of my interviewees that they seek to explain, a, to express a simple message using as simple terms as possible because they want as many people as possible to understand what they're trying to say. So, yes, it's that absolutely <laughs> actively sought to avoid the wordiness. And your second question, um, whether it's mostly anti-something in Russia. I don't, I don't think that it was. Yes, I think it was. I think there are uh, maybe 80-20. Yeah, I think so. I, Last question. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. <laughs> I want to go back a bit to your interviews. You talked about the fact that you interviewed a lot of artists. How do they feel about, and they said that it wasn't political, they didn't, um, if I understand the record, that they didn't do graffitis, or can you give more details about that? And how sure. do you see, because I was curious how, say, um, artists who do this all the time, like, um, for, as a profession, see this expression of art, how they relate to it, and how they see it. They do say they do they do say that they do graffiti art. They are okay. artists, but they're not political artists. And in fact, they say that they're not trying to be political, that they're trying to influence the social sphere. And this is something interesting, especially in Russia, that I saw because it's almost like the political power existed for so long in Russia as an external entity from the people that they feel like they can only affect the social sphere. Mm -hmm. So they can encourage people to fight for bike lanes and child-friendly mm -hmm. Moscow and things like that, but they can't, they can't touch actual legislative process. So they think that by changing the people, they can influence the politics, but still say that they're not political. It's very, it's, that's why I say there's no way, there's no way it can be apolitical. There, I mean, you're affecting the people to affect the politics, but it's not the politics. Thank you very much. Thank you.